Bitcoin's biggest correlation is with global liquidity, and it follows global liquidity um, better than any other asset. Um, so better than stocks, better than gold. Uh, and there's a couple of reasons for that. One is stocks obviously have other variables, things like earnings that can impact their pure correlation with liquidity. Uh, gold has it doesn't have those earnings, but it does have some risk off aspects to it. So sometimes in a in a worsening liquidity environment, gold can actually catch a bid um, just because people want to get out of other things. Um, Bitcoin has the highest correlation directionally with liquidity. Um, I'm I'm fairly bullish on liquidity with a 12 month view. Today, we're diving into Lynn Alden's analysis of the money supply bottom in 2023 and its implications for the economy going forward. Alden explains the intricate connection between the Federal Reserve, the Treasury's T-bill supply, and how the reverse repo facility affects liquidity trends. She clarifies that although the money supply is beginning to rise, it is doing so slowly since banks are still being cautious when it comes to making loans. The market is moving away from high-growth stocks and toward more defensive assets like Walmart and Costco and toward more speculative investments like Bitcoin as a result of the divergence between fiscal and monetary policy. So, what does all this mean for the future of the markets? Stick around as we explore Lynn Alden's outlook on these dynamics. And don't forget to like this video, subscribe, and turn on post notifications for more insightful breakdowns like this. I think most pools of capital treat it as a risk on asset. Um, obviously, there, there are people that are very enthused with the fundamentals and then know that you can hold your own money and move around the world and so it's got those risk off properties but in terms of pricing How most pools of capital most pools of capital sorry uh most pool, sorry yeah most pools of capital treated as a risk on asset um i actually just uh so i worked with uh sam callahan i, I commissioned a a research report from him and he he wrote this report it's on my website now that maps bitcoin to to measures of global liquidity and we found that the uh, Bitcoin's biggest correlation is with global liquidity, and it follows global liquidity um, better than any other asset. Um, so better than stocks, better than gold. And there's a couple of reasons for that. One is stocks obviously have other variables, things like earnings that can impact their pure correlation with liquidity. Uh, gold has it doesn't have those earnings, but it does have some risk off aspects to it. So sometimes in a in a worsening liquidity environment, gold can actually catch a bid uh, just because people want to get out of other things. Um, Bitcoin has the highest correlation directionally with liquidity. I'm fairly bullish on liquidity with a 12 month view. There's a couple ways to do it. Mike, Michael Howe of Cross Border Capital has a has a more proprietary method of, of measuring global liquidity. We used global M2 that's denominated in dollars. And so basically there's two components there. One is the pace of credit creation. So the pace of, of more M2 units, broad money hitting the market. Mm -hmm. And then the other one is what is the dollar index relative to those? And the reason that's relevant is because so much uh, debts internationally are denominated in dollars. And so you, the, 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 the dollar kind of weakening can make global liquidity go up in dollar terms, which are which are relevant relative to their leverage units. Right, okay, um, so it's done on yeah. M2, not M0. Yeah, M2, uh, broad. Um, okay. And 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 so my my base case is you know we've we've been in this consolidation I think we're probably going to grind higher in the next twelve to eighteen months in global M two and I I think and when you look at various measures of evaluation I think that Bitcoin probably grinds higher in that time is my kind of base case. And what's your base case for uh, Nasdaq slash slash uh, tech stocks? And I use that as a, as a proxy for. For growth stocks, what is is your proxy the same that they that they're a function of global liquidity? Yes, I'm a little more concerned about those because in addition to being correlated with liquidity related to the state of the economy right. and and their earnings and their revenues and consumer strength, so uh, I, I do have concerns about the Teslas, the Apples of the world at their at their current valuations, and even Nvidia as 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 much as I think that they're going to keep selling more and more GPUs, I think you can go through pockets of softness. Uh, where a lot of a lot of entities bought all these GPUs that are not making money from them, and they can scale back their purchases for a period of time until they kind of figure out how their how their business model is going to work. And so, you know, I don't really have a high conviction view on these big uh, tech stocks, other than that I don't love the risk reward at these valuation levels uh, and this kind of state of economic softening. And if anything, they're they're treated like they're they're actually more treated like risk off assets, which is people say I don't know what I don't know what I want to own out there, but I don't want to own commercial real estate and I don't want to own cyclical things. So I want to buy Apple and I want to buy Nvidia and I want to buy these big cash rich, you know, entities that are super profitable. Um, and if anything, there's already a lot of capital stuffed into those, which which concerns me. 
I've been using the three pillar portfolio, which is one pillar is is you know equities. Another pillar is um, cash equivalents, things that that are you know kind of protect you in one of those like liquidity risk off cycles. And then the other pillar is is commodity producers and sound money uh, that that can do well in debasement and inflation cycles. So you have this this kind of protection from different scenarios. You know, my base and to George's point, I think it largely depends on whether we get a liquidity pocket or not. Uh, my base case is that we've pr- probably already seen a liquidity pocket um, and that I, I kind of view this more like that 2001 cycle, but you can only be so sure about that type of outlook. Um, and so I think that we, 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 you know, we kind of, a lot of these other assets probably over time grind high, sideways to up uh, in this scenario. Uh, and if we do get a recession, I would think that, you know, in any sort of liquidity pocket, most assets go down. And if you don't get a liquidity pocket, then I think that basically things with earnings struggle, whereas things that don't have earnings, like gold and Bitcoin, uh, that are more like responsive to liquidity, they probably do pretty well. So um, how do you so you how know, do you position yourself? Yeah. Well, what how do you break down? A, I mean, let's just take a, a million dollar portfolio. How do you break it down? Where do you put the money? Uh, so I, I I mean it depends on your risk tolerance. I put a lot of it in equities, uh, a good chunk in in gold and Bitcoin, a, a decent chunk in that kind of uh, energy producer category, um, and then a a smaller chunk in cash equivalents, things like short term treasuries, money markets, T bills. What uh, percentage? Short term uh, tips. Uh, what percentage? Under the fact that you're you know relatively risk uh, that you you wouldn't take re- relative risks at the moment. Um, what what percentage would you be invested? What percentage would you be in cash and cash equivalents? Uh, so for me, I, I have something like fifteen to twenty percent in those cash equivalents. If I was if I was obviously near retirement, I'd probably dial that up to some extent. Uh, but this this comes down to whether or not someone's a, a a a high turnover trading portfolio or a more strategic evergreen portfolio. Mine is more evergreen, so I only make these. I only make small marginal adjustments. Like a, I lean a little bit toward risk, or I lean a little bit toward uh, risk off, rather than making these big sweeping changes about what I expect to occur over, say, the next 12 months. Lynn Alden wraps up by analyzing the current liquidity environment and how it's being influenced by the Federal Reserve, the Treasury General Account, TGA, and reverse repo operations. Since the regional banking crisis in 2023, liquidity has mostly leveled off, and she expects this trend to continue until the Fed starts gradually increasing its balance sheet by 2025. She compares this to Tati's 2019, when the Fed took similar steps after a spike in the repo market. While liquidity is expected to expand, Alden cautions that the increase would likely be modest. A further layer of complication is being added by tighter bank lending, since monetary and fiscal policy are pushing in conflicting directions. This can cause the economy to send out conflicting signals, making it more difficult to determine whether we are entering or exiting a recession. Don't forget to like, subscribe for daily videos like this. Money supply bottomed in 2023 and has been slowly grinding up, uh, partially because we have kind of the treasury offsetting the Fed. Uh, act, active treasury uh, issuance is how some economists like uh, uh, Noriel Robini have described it. Uh, basically, the shortening of, uh, of the issuance of extra T-bills, uh, the draining of their reverse repos. So when you when you kind of take a more aggregate picture of, of both the Fed balance sheet and then these other these other components that are out there, the, the TGA and the, and the reverse repo facility, we've kind of been in this flat liquidity environment ever since the, let's call it the regional bank crisis of, of 2023. That was kind of a pain point we started kind of going sideways rather than down after that. I expect that to probably continue until we reach the end of the reverse repo facility. And then the Fed you know, already projects that by the end of 2025, they would they would probably go back to gradual balance sheet increases, not for stimulus purpose, but kind of like they did in 2019 with the reverse, uh, with the uh, repo spike that they went through. They, they would basically say that we've reached the bottom of ample uh, bank reserves. We want to start going up in, in bank reserves and, and, and maintain ample bank reserves. I think that's how they're, that's the language that they're going to use to frame it. And I think that we're, we're, we're yeah, we're kind of entering that period of money supplies going up, but not particularly fast. Um, and, and that probably lasts. You got to consider the banks too, because it, that in and of itself, to your point, uh, would definitely increase M2 if they're buying from non-banks. But if the rate to which the banks are lending is decreasing more significantly, then it's still going to you know go down. So it's it's definitely you got to take a holistic view. I think is my point. Yeah, and and the so the bank lending component's a big deal. Uh, and that to my 
what I talked about before is that we went through this kind of tight cycle where if you look at senior loan officer surveys, most banks were very conservative. They were basically saying we're tightening all of our standards. Uh, and now they're tightening less than they were a year or, or kind of two years ago. We kind of went this kind of 2022, 2023 cycle. They went through this tightening cycle. There's actually evidence that they're loosening up a little bit. And that's why we have these kind of weird components. Like in some, some metrics say we're headed toward a recession. Other ones are saying we literally just had a recession and we're merging out of it. And it's because you have this kind of divergence between fiscal and monetary policy and this private sector versus public sector situation. If, even if you look at asset positioning, for example, Costco is trading at like 55 or 56 times earnings, right? People are people are not piling into the, the ARK stocks. They're not piling into Bitcoin. They're not piling into uh, small caps. Most of the, the kind of the enthusiasm in the market is actually toward fairly defensive things these these blue yeah, they're chips. selling louis vuitton and they're buying walmart yeah they're <laughs> yeah but walmart's walmart's going vertical costco is going vertical yeah, but, but growth is not going vertical positioned. yeah but growth is not i mean in, as you say growth, growth is yeah yeah um and and, and so I, yeah so i think my point is that basically the, we already in in some ways are positioned like a recession the, the, the credit cycle we kind of went through and the positioning in these kind of defensive assets Lynn Alden explains the current dynamics surrounding money supply, liquidity, and how fiscal and monetary policies interact in a complex environment. She highlights how the money supply bottomed out in 2023 and has since been on a slow upward grind. This gradual increase is partly due to actions by the Treasury, which some economists. Alden believes that until the reverse repo facility runs out, there will be a flat liquidity environment. She also believes that by the end of 2025, the Fed will begin to increase its balance sheet once more, this time not for stimulus but rather to guarantee ample bank reserves, as it did in 2019. Although the pace of this gradual expansion of the money supply won't be quick, banks are already gradually relaxing lending rules, which is a change from the previous tightening cycle. She also highlights the defensive nature of the market, with investors gravitating toward safe havens like Costco and Walmart, while showing less enthusiasm for growth firms and riskier investments like Bitcoin. This indicates a mixed state of the economy, with some indicators pointing to a recession and others pointing to a rebound. Ultimately, it's important to highlight how Lynn Alden's observations enable us to comprehend the careful balancing act that exists between the Fed's management of liquidity, bank lending patterns, and overall market activity. Finally, Lynn Alden urge viewers to consider how these economic indicators can affect their future financial choices. By hinting at a forthcoming episode that delves more deeply into the future of monetary policy and the ramifications of the Fed's increase of its balance sheet, 